we have follow me <clears throat> last week we talked about as a child this week it talks about as children I'm not sure of the title yet that'll come but if you remember in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1 it says at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> I think all of them were like this me of course just tell me, Jesus. Come on. <clears throat> Verse 2, it says, And Jesus, here he shocks them all, called a little child unto them, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, so therefore your salvation, except you be converted, and as a little child humbly receive the kingdom of God, you shall in no case enter in. His application to them then is, whosoever shall not humble himself, as this little child, shall not be great. And if you do humble yourself, you'll indeed be the greatest. Verse 5 then says, and whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, in the context of this scriptures, we're finding children, child, kingdom being all referred to. We've got to not lose track of the context, and that is that Jesus is talking to his disciples who just asked a question. Don't also lose track of the context of the whole book in that Jesus is still, I believe, teaching his disciples to follow him as he makes them what he desires them to be. Specifically, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Ye shall catch men from henceforth, he said in another passage, not in Matthew. <clears throat> so here there's children being referred to. And I believe there is both a physical child we can draw application from, because of course he brought a physical child unto him. But there's also a spiritual child that's being highlighted there, and that's probably the greater focus because, again, he's talking to disciples. And he's talking to them, I believe, with a desire that they would be humble as a little child, and spiritually speaking, they would behave and show characteristics and qualities of this little child. Here's a parable again. This little child is a picture of you, first when you get saved, and then afterwards when you begin to grow in these things. Now, if you remember... In 1 John, we preached that a while ago, that whole book was not dedicated to desiring that people would get saved, but rather that the saved would believe, that the saved would do works, the saved would, would grow in their faith, their works, of course, being as a result of the faith that they have. And in that book, time and time again, the Apostle John writes, my little children, my little children, little children is the last time. He says, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Little children, little children. And that's how he refers to the believers that he's writing at this time. Perhaps a little bit earlier in their faith, or perhaps the apostle expected a greater humility from them. And so these were the greatest in the kingdom he was writing to. They're very humble Christians, very um, lowly in their own sight Christians, very um, as this little child type of Christians. And I think that's probably the case because I find that 1 John is, is a pretty deep book. Even though it was written by John, who we know when his gospel was crystal clear and very plain in his speech, 1 John kind of takes a different turn and he starts to get a little bit, a little bit more complicated in his explanations. And you need to be on, on spiritual edge and prepared to read that and prayed up to read a book like, like 1 John. And I also know this practically because so often people go to 1 John and try to teach some sort of work salvation garbage. Right? Because their, their being ignorant of the scriptures causes them to rest it to their own destruction. And that's usually what happens in First John. And so it's not a shallow book. It's a very deep book. And of course, I'm not trying to say that the Gospel of John is in any way, any, any means sh uh, shallow book. I think it's just a little bit lower hanging fruit. John was written that they could hear and believe. It's like a big gospel tract contained there in your scriptures. First John was written that after you've believed, John... You can grow and believe in, and, and, and follow after and, and use the eternal life that you've been given. Okay, so spiritual children. Verse 5, he says, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. What's this such little child? Well, it's a, it's a humble believer. It's now great in the kingdom of God. Receiving 
them, and whosoever receiveth them, receiveth me. Now, keep your finger there and go over to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at this uh, receive them, receive me thing that Christ is saying. If you receive one of these such little children, you've also received me. Matthew chapter 25. Look with me in verse 37. Matthew 25 and verse 37. Matthew 25 verse 37. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we a strain or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so back in Matthew chapter 18, I believe that's a little bit of what's being highlighted there. They're asking the king, you know, when did we feed thee? When did we quench your thirst? When did we clothe thee? When did we care for thee and visit thee? And the king says, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me. And Matthew chapter 18 says the same thing. The least of these is these little children. That's probably what the disciples were saying. According to the flesh, who's the greatest, they say, and a little child, perhaps in his diapers, come, comes walking up to Jesus at, at the bidding. Jesus just says, Come. And that little child waddles his way up there and, and sits down on Jesus' lap and, and he can't fully form his words and he's not going to give you some great doctrinal thesis. He's just got this belief in Christ, this just unwavering faith in his Savior. He says, if you receive this child, you're receiving me. As you've done it unto the least, you've done it unto me. And I think Contrawise, or, or in, in, in the opposite sense, it would be true. Offend one, you've offended me. Verse 6, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And we know that if we were to go back to Matthew chapter 25, you don't need to for the sake of time, we'd find that the offenders being dealt with there have that same application. That king says, if you've blessed me, if you've helped me, if you've cared for me, if you've cared for one of these least of them, rather, you've cared for me. He says, if you offend one of them, you've offended me as well. And the context of that goes on to talk about the cursedness of being cast into everlasting fire as a result of offending the king. The same is true here in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 8. And this isn't the only place that this is mentioned. So we've seen Matthew chapter 25. We've seen Matthew chapter 18. Jesus also dealt with this back in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. In verse 30 and 29 as well. You can go and basically see these same statements. Look at chapter 18 and verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. And I missed verse 7. Read that first. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom they cometh. So, let me continue back on that thought of this eternal punishment. Chapter, verse 6 talks about those that offend one of these little ones. And, and I usually take that, physically speaking, to some of them that would molest, attack, hurt, harm, maim a little child. And God here says that it was better for that man that a millstone be hanged around his neck and he be drowned in the depths of the sea. And that's a, that's a physical punishment for an, an awful offense. To hurt and harm a little child. Innocence is often found in a child. But here he adds that tag. He says, these little ones which believe in me. So I have to apply that since not every little child is necessarily a believer in God, though to a certain extent they may be, 
because there's this thing called the uh, age of accountability we refer to. Little children are automatically born with, with that faith of a child. Um, David talks about when his infant died, I shall not re- see him no more, he shall not return to me, but I shall go unto him. And so we have that, we could say, okay, this could be talking about physical children. After all, it is a physical, brutal punishment given for offending one of these little child, which believe in him. Okay, so that, that's all right. But again, talking about two groups, physical children, as in a child under the age of, let's just say five, for the sake of argument, but also spiritual children, which could be a 50-year-old man that is just born again and humbly following his, his, his master. The Bible says the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So temporal punishment, and that is to drag that person that offended the believer to the depths of the sea by his neck using a great millstone. Great millstone, if you if you know, is is a, is a giant stone in a mill. It's turned about by that by that stewing of the water as the water passes through. It drives that not a windmill but a water mill usually, and that causes the whole mechanism to make this great this great stone turn within another stone. And the weight of that thing is tons upon tons because it's made to grind grind those items that they're collecting in the mill to powder, to dust essentially. Take tons of weight, throw it around that man's neck and toss him into the sea. He's going to hit the ground hard and fast, right? And we know that Jonah, the journey that he took was likened unto hell, likened unto the destruction of hell. And he was simply brought to the bottom of those mountains in a whale's belly, not quite as, as violent or brutal as what took, is, is being described as taking place here in verse 6. But nevertheless, those, those two images are brought together. So, the punishment would be fit, but here's not marching orders to punish perverts and pedophiles and people that harm children that way. That's not what it's talking about. But this is an example of the severity of offending little ones that believe in Christ. In other words, offending humble servants who are great in the kingdom of God. Here is how seriously God takes it. His spiritual children, all those that believe, that are humble and great in the kingdom of God. You offend them? Well, here's the punishment God wants to dole out or would dole out according to his justice. Verse 7 again, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. I believe that the charge being discussed here is not to offend believers. The warning of the, of the dire and severe consequence to those that do is given in a type of a, of a, of a, of a picture, of a, of a shadow, of a parable, but I believe that this symbolic language here is exactly that. It's symbolic. And the reason why I believe that is because he, he takes it from that man being thrown into the depths of the sea, which by extension we can say, okay, uh, Jonah described that place as being in, in, in hell. But we know that believers, verse 6 says we're talking about believers, don't taste of hellfire. They don't get cast into hellfire. So there's, there's a certain amount of, of symbolic language taking place. It's just like when you look at James chapter 2. He says that the tongue is a, is a deadly member, full of deadly poison. He says it's set on fire of hell. And that's the same thing that's being referred to here, this everlasting fire, this, this hell fire. But we know that our tongues, as, as awful as they are, aren't literally shooting hellfire everywhere, right? It's, it's symbolic. That's how brutal and that's how bad your tongue is. <clears throat> so quick, you know, quickly, and I, I, I've been thinking about this extended example. Verse 7 says, Woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. If there's any offense coming from a believer, who's the man that brings it? <laughs> 
the old man. Right? We talked about this last week. It's the old man. It's that, that man you're to render dead, that if he were to get up, he would just do whatsoever he pleaseth. And actually, that old man, what does he deserve? He deserves hellfire. He deserves death for eternity. That, that's where he was headed. Okay, thanks be to God that I've been given a new man. I'm a new creature in Christ. So there's the ex- ex- extended application that I'm seeing here. Yeah, don't offend children. God will not deal with you anything but harshly. Physically, we'll cast you to the depths of the sea. That's what God wants for you. Spiritually speaking, eternal fire. But here we're talking about saved people. So my offending man, the man in me by whom offense cometh, is that old man. I need to render him to be dead so he doesn't bother me anymore and cause me to offend. So we can continue on. And and in that same vein, I think we're going to see a little bit more clarity about what verse 8 and verse 9 really mean. Let's read these. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. So here we're talking spiritually. And I think that if we were to attempt to battle our sins, battle our temptations in the spirit, this would probably be a good practical way to do it, okay? Here's an example. I have a problem that I'm looking with lust. I have a problem that I'm touching and, and, and drinking perhaps the wrong things. Well, here's, here's how I would, should battle that in the flesh. Think. Now I can't look at the wrong things. Now I can't drink the wrong things. Okay? So if I was to battle, and the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal for a reason, if I was to battle in the flesh, I might as well just start hacking off members. Because it's these members that when they're in control of my will move me to do sins if you want to battle sin in the flesh here's a great way to do it and you know what in history Christians have done this right the monk that has a problem with worldly things scatters away into the woods where there are no worldly things and he thinks he's conquered he's doing this he's removing the temptation forcibly there are Christians in the past that have, have found difficulty controlling their loins and their members and their lusts, so they remove privy members. Say, well, there goes that temptation, because it's better for me. It's better for me to go into life not having that member that causes me to lust than that I would be cast into everlasting fire. But again, this is symbolic language, I believe. Because believers will never taste of everlasting fire, nor hellfire. And Jesus here is preaching to, and it's a little harsh of a, pre- a sermon. It reminds me of Luke chapter six, verse Luke chapter, or, sorry, John chapter six, where he's like, "Except you eat my flesh, you have no part in me." This is one of those like. This is, this is a little bit deep. This is hard to understand, Lord. And, and whenever Jesus starts to preach like this, people just get offended and run away. That's what happened in John 6, verse 66. Ironically enough, if you take it that way. <clears throat> John 6, 6, 6, right? <laughs> From that time, many of his disciples walked no more with him. They turned back. And they went in some other way. They, they stopped walking with God. But here, Jesus is saying, don't offend these little ones which believe in me. And then he starts talking about members and how we can, in the flesh, deal with these members. But based on what we learned last week, and spiritually speaking here, how should we actually um, deal with these members? We reckon them dead. Look, my old man has hands that want to do bad things. My old man has eyes that want to look at bad things. My old man has feet that wants to run around and go and do bad things and and commit sin. 
That's why I reckon him to be dead, cast him down, remove him far from me, and I walk in newness of life. Right? We talked about that last week in the resurrection. So, in the same way, spiritually speaking, if my hand is offending, cut off the hand of that old man and don't give him any power to commit those sins. If my eye is offending, cut out and pluck out that eye and cast it from me. That carnal, physical, fleshly, get rid of it. Render it. Restrict it. Cut it off. And that's essentially what we have to do. My members are offending, cut it off and cast it from us. My eyes are offending, cut them off and cast them from us. And rather, render my spiritual members to Christ and allow Him to do with them as He pleases. Now, Jesus starts talking about this little child. And mind you, we're in a moment here where these disciples are welling up with a little bit of pride. They're starting to feel like they got this thing figured out. They're starting to feel like, I really got this Christ walk down. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm serving Him. Hey, hey Lord, who's the greatest? <laughs> he says, basically, none of you. This little child brings him up. And this child only knows to follow humbly and, 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 and just trust the Lord. And they're trusting and relying and counting upon themselves. If the child's going to overcome, he's just going to believe on his Lord. If these are going to overcome, it seems like those that are seeking to be greatest, they're going to overcome by having to chop off some members in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I'd rather just yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto life. Just pray that God would use my hands, pray that God would use my eyes, pray that God would guide my feet. He never, I'd rather do that than get the machete out. I mean, what's easier, right? That's how we have to think of our spiritual walk. Either we, by faith, believe on God and seek after Him and follow Him, or better start chopping off members because it's just a matter of time that they get you in trouble. So, <clears throat> he then goes on to talk about offense. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. Now I said that those little ones are the humble Christians are the believers, it says there in, in verse 6. And those that are, therefore, according to verse 4, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're serving God. They're humble. They're, they're obeying all of his lead. And yet offense is coming upon them. And he's considering that this offense might even come upon them, this little child, at the hands of his own disciples. We talked about earlier about friendly fire, about, about Christians taking shots at other Christians. And I think sometimes Christians are worse to Christians than the world ever could be. I don't know why. Maybe it's because, because we're family. We know how to hurt one another. We, we know how to get our digs in. We know how to... We, 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 can be, we can be vengeful in our dealing with Christians. I mean, what, what hurts more Christian to Christian than, than taking the words of God as a weapon and throwing them at one another, right? I got a verse for that. Thou fool, right? That's why, the, that's why Jesus, way back, he, he said, you know, don't, don't say your brother Raka. We'll call him a fool, right? By our love one for another, we're supposed to know one another. And so I think Jesus' transition brings in the little child and says, hey, don't offend this little one. Perhaps when the disciples who thought they'd really had it figured out, they'd really made it. I'm pretty good at this Christian life. Perhaps when Jesus brought the little child up, they were like, what's this child going to teach me? What, 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 is, what is this? Look at him. He can't even, he, 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 can't, he wets himself. <laughs> he needs his mom, mama to change his diapers. He needs his daddy to lead him about and carry him. <clears throat> and Jesus is saying, you got to stop being so hard on little ones that believe in me. <clears throat> Christians often get caught and found guilty of despising little ones that believe in him. And he's, he's separating the little ones which believe, being that they're humble, they're great in the kingdom of heaven, and they, and they follow and serve their Lord, from, from those that are causing the offense. The one are completely spiritual, yielded to God, trusting him, because they can't do anything but trust him. What can a little child do but trust their daddy? Right? He's separating those 
from those that are offending and they're walking in the flesh. And this is what we always, we always see. The Christian that is serving God, trusting God, in God's will, humble, is getting attacked by Christians who are full of pride. I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, of course. But the truth is, they're so fleshly and carnal. The best thing they could do right now to keep themselves from sinning, since they're so far from the spiritual truth and actually following what the, the little child is doing, they're so far from that, these, these proud, arrogant Christians might as well just start lobbing off limbs because it would be better for them than to face what God has for them. The physical death, that's, that's brutal. The spiritual punishment, though, though I believe a symbol, is brutal. And Christians, carnal Christians, because they don't like the conviction of the Word of God, because they don't like seeing humble believers succeed in the Christian life and in the Christian walk. They don't like seeing that, that their submission is making them great in the kingdom of God. The carnal Christian will resort to despising, backbiting, hating, attacking, offending, these little children which believe in him. Remember, John was preaching a very difficult book to little children. Christians that are advancing, growing, getting stronger, are not only going to face attacks from the world, from Satan, they're also going to face attacks from carnal brethren who are full of pride, thinking they're the greatest. <clears throat> so he says, take heed. He says, listen up. Verse 10, it says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones which believe in me, of course. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. I wonder what of the angels, of those that think they're grace in the kingdom of God and have not been converted and do not walk as little children, I wonder what of those angels. I, I just I just see he focuses on those that are humble, servants of God, growing in grace and the knowledge of their Savior as having angels always beholding the face of the Father. I don't know, does our does our does our position in faith actually delegate the position of our angels which are in heaven? I don't know. It it, it could be. But it does say that they're angels, possessive. These little ones have angels in heaven, and these little ones that have angels in heaven have direct access to God. They always see His face. <clears throat> it reminds me of Psalm 123. It says, The eyes of the servant look to the hand of the master. In other words, the king is, is waiting there. The servant is over here, just, just eyes fixed on them. Maybe a poor application, but, but my... My little doggy at home is just like that, right? She, I'm the alpha, I'm the master, and so I'll, I'll sometimes look over into the room and I'll just see her just like staring at me, just with these, these beaming bright eyes, just waiting for me to, to move my hand, to guide something, to direct something. There's just obedience that comes from, from a dog like that. And these angels, I'm not making a perfect comparison here, but they're always looking to the hand of the master. They see his face. They're waiting for God the Father, to say go, to say oh do, to say would you, and, and, to, and to move them. And the Bible records, it's in Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about those that fear him, trust in him. And so I believe, especially if I'm humble, especially if I'm as a little child, especially if I'm walking in faith and therefore deemed great in the kingdom of heaven, I don't think I'd ever be greatest. But if I'm, if I'm given that position because I've received it by faith, that my, verse 10, angel, this is plural, right? 
my angels are before my Father in heaven waiting for the command to go and encamp it round about me as I fear him. I have spiritual protection. I have spiritual <clears throat> opportunity for demonstration in my life. Power that comes not just from the Holy Spirit of God living in me, but also angelic authority available to me if I am as one of these little children. There's always going to be a benefit of being humble and prostrate before God, coming to His cross, bowing down before Him, admitting to Him as a little child would that, that I, I can't get myself dressed, I can't put my shoes on, right? I can't walk that far. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Verse 11, 4. So here's the big because. That's what that is. All these things that he's talked about to now come to this point where he says, because or for the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost <clears throat> and God of course is saving us from our lost state when we're without Christ and without salvation he's also saving us from our lost state where we decide we would walk in our flesh and in our own lusts and in our own desires <clears throat> verse 14 says it's uh, not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So, when we're in those moments, can't be talking about anybody here, of course, <clears throat> when we're feeling like we're pretty great in the kingdom, we're feeling pretty proud, we're feeling pretty sure of ourselves in the Christian life, I, I got this figured out. I just need God to put a stamp of approval on my lifestyle and tell me I'm the greatest. Hey, Jesus, who's greatest in your kingdom? <laughs> right? When I got that feeling, <clears throat> I am more likely to, and I got to ask myself, why I would? Why would I destroy, despise, seek to make lost, or cause my brother to perish? <clears throat> why do I beat down brethren that are walking let's say let's say better than me for lack of better terms people that are in the spirit people that are, are following god that are that are sh are showing fruit of the everlasting life that is in them why would i in that <laughs> who's the greatest in the kingdom lord why would i look on them and 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 and, and despise them backbite them hate them attack them why would i do that well because i want to make myself feel better and so instead of me getting right with God coming up to that level. And how do you get up to that level? If you want to be exalted, you abase yourself. Instead of me humbling myself, it's easier in the pride and arrogancy that I have to take a brother that is riding high in the faith of God and just try to bring him down to my level. Isn't that always the case? I'm sure you've countered these people at work. They think that they should be promoted. I should be the boss. Instead of working hard like the boss did to become the boss, do you know what they do? They just tear them down. He doesn't do this right. He doesn't do that right. He fails at this. I don't like this. Talking bad about them. Dragging others down to their own level. And this is what the I'm the greatest in the kingdom type of Christian does. But you know what the little child does? This is great. The little child goes on humbly, going where the father bids him, the little one goes on humbly being exalted as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The little one which believes on God, trusts Him, walks in faith, has angels beholding the face of the Father that are going to guard Him, protect Him, secure Him, help Him walk through these challenges that He's facing Him. But you know what the carnal Christian does? Ugh, he's not so good. Oh, I don't like how he does that. Oh, just backbiting and hating and attacking. Trying to trip up their fellow believer as they're just simply trying to humbly walk with God. <clears throat> I've done it. 
seen it done. I don't want to be there anymore. Jesus says, humble yourselves if you want to be great. Abase yourselves and you will be exalted. Ultimately, believe in me and trust in me and admit that you can't do it. I'll walk for you. All through this, again, why do carnal Christians despise, destroy, seek to make loss or cause to perish their brethren? <clears throat> do they not know that God is watching? Verse 11, God's whole point in coming is to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he's mindful of those that were lost, that he desires to be, become and converted as little children and to, and, and to join up with him. We see his care in verse 12. How think ye? If a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek for that astray? And if it so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. The Bible records that Jesus is watching for even one of his sheep that goes astray. And I think the extension of this, of this parable is, is little children, humble, follow their master wherever they go. And now we have sheep, humble, following their shepherd wherever he goes. And so the sheep here, 90 and 9, are just like those children. Humble, great in the kingdom of God. One of them goes astray. Well, why would that be in the context? Because another believer that thought he was something, thought he was great in the kingdom, full of himself, decided to cause him to perish, decided to make him lost, decided to offend this little one that believed on him in order to drive him away from serving God. He decided to be a stumbling stone in his brother's way. I believe that's what's happening here. This is what Jesus is warning his disciples about. You guys are starting to get full of yourselves. You think you're really something. Let's, let's, let's get humble here. Because if you're going to go around and offend other believers just because you think you're something great, and you're going to go and you're going to attack somebody that's humbly following me just to drive them away from serving me so that you can make yourself look better, huh, just know I'm going to go looking for that one. I'm going to go watching and, and, and protecting and guarding that one. The angel of the Lord is going to go before me and campeth round about that one and care for him. They're always watching and waiting for me to look for my sheep that have run astray. And, he's, and you know what God says? And when I find it, I'm going to rejoice more over that one sheep that you have sought to destroy, Christian. I'm going to rejoice more for the return into, in, in, into, into my presence of that one sheep that you tried to offend and caused to perish from the way, Christian. I'm going to rejoice more in the return of that one sheep than I will over the 99 that are still here. God has care for even that one. I believe this is a, what Jesus here is teaching. Verse 14, Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. One of these little ones, verse 6 says, which believe in me. I believe he's talking about saved people interacting with saved people. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We've got to be careful when dealing with other Christians. I know that we always don't see eye to eye on every jot and tittle of Scripture. I know that there's all types of room for contention to swell up for for pride to get in us. But we have to understand that each one of us has individual soul liberty. We're all going to stand before God. Who are you that judgeth another man's servant? Ultimately, every Christian is going to stand or fall before their Savior when it comes time to present themselves before Him. <clears throat> in 1 Peter... One of the items, attributes, he desired that, it might have been Second Peter, he said, add to your faith 
virtue, temperance, knowledge, and on. one of them is brotherly kindness. And I believe too often nowadays, and what, what Jesus was perhaps um, trying to teach the disciples, <clears throat> was this idea of esteeming other better than themselves. Whereas these disciples, they just wanted to esteem themselves. I want to be, to- I want to be called them the greatest. I want to be told that I'm the greatest. And Jesus says, this least, this little child is greater than you. <clears throat> Brotherly kindness, we're definitely lacking it. And so Ephesians chapter 4 talks a little bit about how we ought to interact one with another. In verse 1, you see, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation with which ye are called. Now, that worthy walk is after the same fashion as you received Christ Jesus. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk. So this worthy walk is by grace through faith. Verse 2, it says, With all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And as believers, we should have unity. Why? Because, verse 4, there is one body, there is one Spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so, since we have oneness and unity when it comes to being a body of believers, there ought not be no, any schism or division with respect to our interaction. And when there is, well, only by pride cometh contention. Every time we have issues one with another, it's because pride has gotten involved. <clears throat> but we ought to be united. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 now remember, I talked about how the, old, the, the man that is most offensive to me spiritually, if I was take, to take Matthew 18, maybe in the like third practical application of it, and start to think about the interaction between the new man, which is a little child, born again in the Spirit and walking in Christ, and the old man, which is the one that is always trying to offend. If I was, if I was to take that as an extension, then my old man is the one that is constantly causing offense, and he's the one that deserves the hellfire. He's the one that deserves to, to, um, to fall because he's the one that's always causing me to stumble. And I'm thankful that God came to seek and save me and he's going to care for that new spirit. I'm, I'm thankful that God came to and will seek and save me even if I stumble and fall away from, from the group as a little child does. Ken. Ephesians 4 and verse 22 <clears throat> were to put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so when we put that off, we put on what would be that little child, what would be that believing, faithful little child, the new man, verse 24, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, now these are going to be the attributes of the old man, lying, speak everyone truth with his neighbor. So, This isn't, again, just an application of the battle going on in me all the time. We can also deal with the proud and arrogant Christian who would attack the Christian that's walking in the newness of life. That is appearing to be perhaps more righteousness and causing envy. That man, that Christian, ought to be converted and become as a little child. He does so by putting away, verse 25, lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are all members one of another. That points back to the beginning of the chapter. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, when we're dealing one with another, don't let our disagreements fester and cause us to have wrath that grows and grows and grows. Don't let the sun go down upon it. If, if you have issue with me, bring it to me as soon as you can. That you can be angry for that moment with me, but not sin not as a result of letting that root of bitterness grow up in you. That's how Christians ought to interact one with another. It says, neither give place to the devil. And that's exactly what happens when we let our anger fester. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing that is good 
that he may have to give to him that need it. Be given people, not thieves, of course. Let no corrupt communication proceedeth out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We have to be those that have tongues that minister grace instead of always ministering corruption and destruction and doubt and sin. We need to edify and build up one another. In conclusion, verse 33, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. All of these things, put it away along with that dead man, put him down. Be as the little child, be as the new man. And walk in that. In verse 32, Here's the bottom line for how we ought to treat one another. How we as spiritual children ought to treat other spiritual children. Be ye kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, there's a lot to be said that with respect to forgiving one another. Even when we go back to where it says, be angry and sin not. You know, there's a lot of times that I get offended by what somebody else says, and I could really, instead of having to go and deal with it, or instead of having, having to leave it and fester it in me, that I could just forgive and realize that, that, that you know, a brother offending me might have been a miscommunication. A brother offending me is... is is of low importance compared to maintaining a brother in a relationship with them and being one and united and walking worthy in the vocation where which I'm called. So the best thing that we can do one to another is not seek to be the best, but rather just walk humbly before our God. And as we do, treat others with kindness. Be tender-hearted, be be be, be forgiving one to another. And of course, as always, our greatest example is Christ and what he did for us. Christ doesn't hold bitterness, wrath, envy against us. No, rather, Christ wants us to be closer to him. He wants us to be in that love relationship with him. He wants us to grow in these things. And so then why do we get offended when others grow faster than us? No, we ought to encourage that. I think that's a little bit of what what Christ has been talking about in this passage anyways. He, he brings a physical child to illustrate a spiritual truth and then corrects his disciples with how they've treated that physical child in that scenario in order to point them to a spiritual truth. Be kind one to another. Be humble as this little child. Don't offend this little child. And really, again, you're not going to be able to do this in the power of your own will. It's a faith walk as always. All right, thank you, Father, for this scripture. I, I pray, God, that, um, that this was clear. I pray, God, that you would bring clarity to it, even as we, uh, we walk this week. I think this is another passage that um, is probably far, far deeper than I could, even, I could even begin to understand. Maybe I'll have to read it through 20 more times and and live 30 more years in this earth before you'll, you'll fully bring it to me. The bottom line is, Lord, you don't want us to offend little children that believe on you. Okay? So you desire rather that we would walk as that little child and not face flack and offense and hardship from those that aren't walking in that same truth. Help us to be humble. Help us to be as little children. And Lord, if we do feel offense coming from those that aren't walking in that fashion, Lord. Help us to be kind, tender-hearted, and forgive them even as you have forgiven us. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll sing one more hymn and then we'll all be dismissed. Let's go to uh, 234. Again, we'll keep keep reminding you we are a few weeks, the first week of May, first Sunday of May from uh, 
new building, new service time. So it's going to be a little bit earlier for us. So maybe if we're used to sleeping in on Sunday, we might want to start preparing. <laughs> I don't get to sleep in. <clears throat> but it'll be nice to, to get up and have a morning service. So precious is Jesus, my Savior and King. His praise all the day long with rapture I sing. To Him in my weakness for strength I can cling. For He is so precious to me. For He is so precious to me. For He is so precious to me. Tis heaven. missed.